Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. The coexistence between humans and animals was an important topic on many episodes of Wild Kingdom, including the one you'll see tonight. Many organizations and cultures throughout the world remain committed to identifying ways to preserve and even enhance their natural environment. The Amazon rainforest is a terrific example of that collaboration in action. Native cultures who used to poach animals and slash and burn the forest now benefit from its beauty. The revenue generated through tourism has created sustainable jobs for many people who call the rainforest their home. Their future is very bright in the wild kingdom. So sit back and relax and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom right here on RFD TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by Mutual of Omaha, the people who pay. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Throughout the Japanese islands, there is a large population of monkeys known as Japanese macaques. Due to their human-like characteristics, they have become of great interest to scientists everywhere. Recently, the Japanese Primate Institute invited the world-renowned primatologist, Dr. C.R. Carpenter and me, to observe the activities and social structure of the macaques. One of our principal interests was in observing the behavior and social organization of a very large colony of Japanese macaques, which was organized into three groups. The colony occupied Takasakiyama, a 2,000 foot high tree covered mountain. For centuries, perhaps, the Buddhist priests protected the monkeys. Then, 21 years ago, the Japanese scientists established a feeding ground here near the old Buddhist temple on Takasakayama. The colony grew rapidly, and the temple feeding ground provided scientists with a unique opportunity to study these primates closely. Each of the groups has its own territorial range. This is the range of A group, of B group, and of C group. Their behavior here provides an unexcelled opportunity for study by scientists from all over the world. Our observation of the macaques began at the southernmost of the Japanese chain of islands, Kyushu, not far from the city of Beppu, at Takasakiyama. We call our story, The Macaques of Japan. The densely overgrown mountain called Takasakiyama rises sharply from the sea, and the Buddhist temple is halfway up its slope. Here we see astride the temple roof a female macaque of group A intently grooming herself. She pays very little attention to us, well accustomed to seeing priests and scientists walking about. However, our first interest is to observe the behavior of group C macaques waiting a little distance away from the temple on Takasakiyama slope. Even here, the macaques are quite unafraid of us. As Dr. Carpenter goes a little farther up the mountain, I'll observe from here. From here, I'll watch the group traveling to the feeding ground. My primary interest today is to take notes of the behavior of the macaques ready to approach the feeding area. Already there are some individuals close by awaiting the signal to enter the temple feeding ground. The grooming process is very important in macaque society. This mother carefully grooms the coat of her infant. Mother infant ties are close. And as with most non-human primates, groups and colonies are well organized. Macaques are curious, and fear of humans is almost absent, since for generations they've been protected and fed here on Takasakiyama. Like energetic children, youngsters play actively while their mothers feed. 
This one is as intrigued by my behavior as I am in watching the complex play of Lee's juveniles. It is hard to ignore this friendly macaque who senses that I have some peanuts. To my surprise, he finds the peanuts without being aggressive. There's the start of the anticipated command signal. The display is given by the second ranking male, a dominant male of group C. These signals encourage the last animals of group A to leave the temple feeding area. His signals are audible and visible for considerable distances. They alert the group C macaques that it is safe to move onto the feeding ground. A mother carrying her infant begins the general movement and others of the troop quickly follow her lead. With the signal given and the group moving down slope, I'll rejoin Marlin. We'll make closer observations of individual animals as they enter the feeding area. Notes we take now will provide a better understanding of the social structure within this group. More mothers carrying infants and walking juveniles join the procession. High above them, the big beta male gives the treetop a final vigorous shaking. His signals have set all of his group into general movement. From everywhere on their territory on Takasakayama, they head directly for the place where for so many years they've been fed. Many of the macaques have arrived before us and are already beginning to feed on the fresh supply of wheat spread on the ground immediately after the former group left the area. In spite of the fact that there is food enough for all of them to eat, they store the grain temporarily in their cheek pouches to be eaten later. Their hands are almost human and they use them expertly to pick up grains of wheat. Dominant males move through the group and others give way to them. This beta male has a reddening of his face and rump indicating the beginning of another breeding season. He's presently second in command to the half-blind patriarch who is the alpha male. He's independent and self-reliant and acts with others to control the group. This he does with other males, using aggression if necessary. Family tenderness is immediately evident. Mothers are very protective of their babies. But on an even higher level of mutual aid, there are female juveniles who learn to care for their younger brothers and sisters. Occasionally, a baby is born deformed, like this little fellow whose arms and legs are too short. It is tenderly cared for by its devoted older sister. These young ones are already full members of the group. We'll observe them more closely after we've joined our scientist post here in Japan. Our host is Dr. Akisato Nishimura of Japan's Primate Institute. He's presently studying macaque behavior. He'll show us the importance of communal grooming in their social structure. There is no form of social behavior the macaques seem to enjoy more than grooming. It builds and maintains social harmony and possibly has considerably more significance in a social sense than we yet realize. Although all the macaques enjoy grooming and being groomed, grooming is mostly done by females. 
Dominant males like this gamma male receive the most grooming and give the least. Therefore, Dr. Nishimura says the grooming process is not only just a pleasant thing to do and experience, but it has an important influence on the macaque's individual role and status. Only continuing close observation and scientific analysis of the process in studies like these being done by doctors Carpenter and Nishimura may provide the understanding man seeks. So far, we know that debris is removed from the fur and sometimes parasites, which the groomer eats. We are also studying the nursery area habits of infants. This nursery is apart from the feeding area. Here, the youngsters can romp and play with each other, or if they prefer, sometimes play by themselves. One day, this infant might become a dominant male, signaling to his group by shaking a treetop. Females bring their babies to the nursery area and allow the young ones ample freedom to play. but all done under the supervision of one or two nearby females who act as babysitters of a sort, keeping the youngsters together and protected. When scientists observe these Japanese macaques over prolonged periods of time, they learn to recognize many individuals. Each macaque, like this beta male, has a distinctive personality and appearance. Dr. Nishimura, in particular, knows most of the adult macaques of all three groups which feed here. He keeps close account of the growth and activities of each of them, clearly placing each in its proper niche in the social structure. It is time now, Dr. Carpenter tells me, to test the problem-solving ability of these macaques, some of which are still in trees along the outer edge of the feeding area. This open spot among the pine trees will be ideal for the little test Dr. Carpenter wants to give them. It will be a test he's never tried with them before. He has firmly attached a fresh orange to a length of cord. As I anchor the loose end, Dr. Carpenter adjusts the fruit so it cannot be reached by a macaque either jumping for it or reaching for it from the branch above. The object is to see if the hanging fruit will entice one of the macaques into reasoning how to get it. This one, we can see, has the right idea immediately. But what is important to our studies is whether or not he can get the orange without a lot of trial and error. He certainly seems to be giving considerable attention to the problem. Great. He solved the pull-in problem on the first trial. The next time this test situation is tried, he'll know exactly what to do. What's more, other macaques will learn the method from him. They learn simple things like our hanging orange test quite rapidly, but remain baffled by problems that are more complex. Such a problem is ready for them now with some testing equipment that Dr. Nishimura has brought to the edge of the feeding area. Here we'll have a cord to the end of which is attached a clear plastic box. We'll place the fruit inside and then reseal the lid with a tape that has tabs. If the macaques can solve this problem in advance, They'll simply pull up on the tabs to release the lid and thus get the fruit. The cord keeps them from running off with the box.
Our second subject has no more luck than the first and doesn't seem able to figure out how to get at the prized orange. His reasoning at this point seems to be limited to getting away with the box, even if it means biting the rope in two, which he can't do. We've decided this problem is too complex. We'll have to simplify it. While Dr. Nishimura is doing this, Dr. Carpenter and I will move to a point where we can observe better. Dr. Nishimura has prepared a specially knotted short length of cord which he threads through an opening in the lid and anchors it there. This will provide a handle by which the lid can be pulled off by an intelligent macaque. With the plastic box problem now simplified, Dr. Nishimura is hardly able to move a short distance away before a keen-minded macaque moves in and very neatly solves the problem. He's suddenly diverted by a male that is signaling from the treetop. It's a signal that the group's stay in the feeding area must end. At once, those near the temple obediently begin moving out. Having completed our observations at Takasakiyama, Dr. Carpenter and I journeyed to tiny Koshima Island to observe the remarkably resourceful macaques there. The macaque colony of Koshima Island numbers about 100, but its organization is like the 1,500 macaques on Takasakiyama. Somewhat wilder than those macaques near the temple, they've nevertheless grown accustomed to being given food, provisionalized, as Dr. Carpenter calls it. Dr. Nishimura scatters sweet potatoes for them, and several of their recently learned behavioral patterns are shown. The younger macaques, like the older ones, are not afraid of man. They exhibit little fear. As the sweet potatoes are tossed out, each macaque tries to gather as many as he can carry. But what's most surprising to me is that these Koshima macaques have learned bipedal locomotion, walking upright in order to carry even more potatoes. Now, as we watch one walk upright, we see one of their most unusual learned skills. While some of the older ones stay near, the younger macaques head for the water with their food. Monkeys like getting into the water. These macaques have learned that water cleans gritty sand from their food, thus making it more enjoyable to eat. Dr. Nishimura says that years ago, a young female macaque learned to wash her food. Others saw her do it and copied the action. Now almost all do it, with only the oldest refusing to learn. Sometimes the younger ones will actually play about in the water, but mostly they are just content to wash their food. It isn't only with food as easy to handle as a sweet potato that the washing process occurs. Dr. Nishimura will demonstrate this fact for us as soon as he returns with a pouch full of wheat. The wheat that Dr. Nishimura has will be dumped onto the sand and pressed well into it with his feet.
For this demonstration on learned behavior, Dr. Nishimura will be sure that the wheat kernels get quite well mixed with sand. Almost at once, the Koshima Island macaques come running, knowing that another free meal from the scientists is in prospect. Many of them use their mouths to get grain not yet mixed with sand. But when an even greater effort is made to mix it well with the sand, they still are not deterred. Now they use their hands to pick it up, sand and grain together. Now here's one who learned as a youngster what to do. She clenches in each hand all she can, then deliberately dumps it in the water. The sand washes free from the grain, and the clean grains are then carefully picked out. The clean grains are swiftly popped into the cheek pouches to be eaten later. Younger Koshima macaques have learned that running water cleans grain better than still water. None, however, will dispute the alpha male's claim to any food he wants. The alpha male may refuse to carry grain to water, but he's learned to be very deft at getting it out once others have dumped it in to be washed. The observations that have been made here may help man to understand better one more facet of the wild kingdom, the world of the Japanese macaques. Although the feeding of the macaques at Takasakiyama began as a simple means of protecting this interesting primate, it developed into a great scientific opportunity. At few other places in the world can the activities, the social organization, and the primitive behavior of a group of wild primates be so closely observed. The studies that have already been conducted, those presently underway, and those yet to come are extremely useful research. They are helping man not only to understand the primates and their relations to man, but perhaps even to clarify the fundamental causes of why man himself acts the way he does. It is another example of the importance of setting aside sanctuaries where wild animals may live and reproduce in peace. By the research data gathered there, we are learning to understand better not only the place of animals, but also the place of man in the wild kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, the people who pay, has presented Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, helping people find Medicare solutions for over 50 years. To learn more about plan options or how to protect your kingdom, contact us today. Mutual of Omaha, protect your kingdom.